So now we can uh, reconvene our regular board meeting. And I am going to announce that the board has approved the minutes of the one of 1 12 2021, 3 9 2021, and 4 6 of 2021. In addition, we are we voted to release all of the, the executive session minutes. So I don't get my next page here. Of 112.21, and 406.21. And the last action we took was to um, authorize the destruction of the existing records of the executive session that are more than 18 months um, old, which include the recordings of the executive session of 12 10 19. All right, everybody feel I got them all? Yes. Okay. I have a que I have a question, Nancy, just because it yes, of what you said differed slightly from the annotated. Um, the annotated only has the January twelfth, twenty twenty one, and the March 9th, twenty twenty one for the release of the right. minutes. And yes, you and added we're to release all three of them. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Good. They added Thanks that, for clarifying Katie. that. Yeah, we did add that on. Yep. All right. So now, if someone would be willing, we need an, a motion to accept the agenda as presented. I move to accept the agenda as presented. Second. All right, roll call vote. Meredith, do you want to start? Aye. Roger? Aye. Cedric? Aye. Aye here as well. All right, so we have accepted the agenda as presented. Our next item is a public hearing. Um, so I am now going to open a public hearing to receive public comments on the fiscal year 21-22 combined budget and appropriation ordinance. Is there any member of the public who would like to make a statement during the public hearing regarding the fiscal year 2021-22 combined budget and appropriation ordinance? Nancy, there's no one reporting here at Kerr facility. Okay. And I don't think there's anybody else either then, right? So you don't have any, there's no one who's joined the meeting to. Okay, very good. Well, I, since there have been no comments made, I will declare the hearing closed and we will move on to general public comment, which there probably isn't any of either. None reporting at Kerr. Okay. And nobody online. All right. so. I believe we are back to Elsie, who is going to introduce our newest intern. Actually, we, we have Ashley here tonight. And, we have Ashley? Uh, oh, okay. Yep. So Ashley's here, and uh, she's going to introduce our intern. And uh, Ashley is our outreach and wellness coordinator and also the, uh, the uh, king of our Urbana and getting it out in our community. So... Um, she's been doing a great job, but I'll let her introduce the intern. Thanks, Corky. Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, as Corky said, I am the Outreach and Wellness Coordinator here at the district, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for having me tonight to introduce our new Outreach and Wellness intern, Tyler Jancic. Um, so Tyler joined the district as our Urbana unit supervisor this spring. And we look forward to him playing even more of a role on the UPD team this summer as the intern. Um, but I'll give Tyler a minute to tell you a little bit more about himself. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Tyler Jancic. Um, I'm currently a senior at the U of I, majoring in community health and neuroscience. Um, I'm also from the upper suburbs of Chicago, a little town called Wilmette. Um, so... <laughs> I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I truly fell in love with um, park districts ever since I was at the age of 15, where I received my first job as a junior counselor at the Wilmet Park District. Um, ever since, I always loved connecting with uh, different patrons and just trying to improve their daily quality of life through just general recreational activities. 
Um, and through working with Ashley and the entire outreach and wellness departments, I've already learned so much and I'm truly looking forward to learning more um, at the Urbana Park District. Thanks. And I'd like to add in that Tyler is doing a fantastic job. He's um, just a ball of energy, huge smile every time somebody talks to him and uh, really appreciate him being here at the Urbana Park District. Well, well, we'll welcome you aboard. And I don't think we need to tell you that you're working with an absolutely fabulous team. So it's going, I think as far as internship goes, you've kind of got the best of the best here. Cause this is a, this is a, this is a good park district and the people who work here are better than great. So I hope you enjoy it as, as, as much as I expect you will. Okay, UPTAC appointments. Thank you. Okay, um, I can speak on that a little bit. Um, so the, the first thing is we did get two uh, more applications uh, for new UPDAC members, which I forwarded out to um, all of the board. Uh, so, um, you know, I've spoken with both of them. They're both very excited. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously um, we, we were hoping to get a few more people. So, um, you know, they're up for three-year terms. Um, happy to answer any questions about about those two candidates. We also have an item. Um, we have three uh, candidates um, to appoint to vacancies on the committee, which we had discussed um, in updash planning and I think at the prior board meeting as well, um, you know, approaching and asking uh current up deck members whose terms are expiring if they'd be willing to stay on for one more year for a short one year term to fill those vacancies so that we have a minimum of 15 members uh, as specified in our bylaws so um all three uh we have uh howie shine sarah roper and gene Haley to extend their their term um and all three were super excited about it they really enjoyed being on up deck and i think um all three have, have made really valuable contributions to the committee. I, I appreciate that that solution, Kelsey. One of the things though that I, I noticed and, and I, I wondered um, how difficult is it to get um, UPTEC representatives north of Main Street? Because on that map, there's no yeah, way. no, I, I know. It's definitely on uh, my mind and, and I think on UPDAC's mind as well. Um, and that's, we're, we're going to be aggressively recruiting uh, okay. north of Maine. Um, we, we started doing a little bit of that this term, but I think um, we're going to try to gear up for something more sustained. Um, so they have more sustained uh, presence in those areas. But, but yeah, that's, it is, it is true. It's, we're woefully lacking um, with representation from, from those communities. So we're going to do it's, our best to fix that moving forward. It's It's been a hard, I think, I mean, what I was saying, it's been a hard year is just kind of silly. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's part of it. And I know that LaShonda worked that the King Park neighborhood pretty hard. So it wasn't, I would say it wasn't for lack of trying. I think people are just working real hard to get their feet back on the ground. And I, I think that if we persist, we will, we will be able to get a, a wider um, dispersal rate of folks on, on our, uh, on our committee, because we certainly need that. And I, and I went door to door. I mean, everybody we talked to was very nice and receptive and that's the only area we canvassed. I mean, we, yeah. we were focusing uh, yeah. entirely north of university. So yeah, um, I wasn't being critical in any way. It's just an, an observation. No. You know it as well as I do. I just uh, felt that I, I wanted to make a public comment to that effect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, yes. We, also, we also tried to push it at the uh, um, vaccine clinic at King School. Now, we don't know how many of those were actually north of Main Street, but um, we did push it. So, you know, that was our probably our first big attempt. I, I mean, I'm not sure when Katie and Kelsey went door to door, but we did have a big push to try and bring in some representatives from that area, but yeah. we'll keep trying. 
We also yeah. <clears throat> didn't have our traditional summer events. I know at least through, you know neighborhood nights, we do have a up deck table. We do try to get some awareness and you know talk to people when we can. So hopefully we can improve that situation too. We'll just have to get different thinking hats on for different different strategies. All right, so we need a couple of motions. Anybody willing to step up? Uh, I move to appoint Ashley Moore and Gary Stensland to serve three-year terms as part of the 2021 to 2024 class for the Urbana Park District Advisory Committee. Second. All right, we need a roll call vote. Cedric, you want to begin? Aye. Roger. Aye. Meredith. Aye. I here as well. So that passes unanimously. I move, I move to appoint Howard Sheen, uh, Sarah Roper, and Jean Paley to one-year terms to fill vacant positions on the Urbana Park District Advisory Committee. Second. Okay, good. We need a roll call vote. Man, this feels like a carousel. Uh, Meredith. Aye. Roger. Aye. Cedric. Aye. I vote aye as well. So that is a, um, passes unanimously. Um, UPDAC report, uh, Laura included an UPDAC report in our, in our minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Any comments? All right, then our next action is um, our consent agenda. Um, on our consent agenda, our approval of the minutes of the June 1st, 2021 study session approval of the minutes of the June 8th, 2021 annual and regular board meeting, monthly reports, um, action to accept the philanthropy report and gifts listed with gratitude, and approval of the monthly paid accounts payable. Now, anybody who wants, does anyone want to take anything off? It's the prerogative of any of the board members to remove something from the agenda to uh, discuss during older new business. Kate, doesn't sound like it, so we need a motion. I move. Go, go ahead. ahead, Rod. Okay. I move to approve all the action items on the consent agenda and accept all the information items listed on the consent agenda in an omnibus manner. Second. All right, Cedric. Aye. Roger. Aye. Meredith. Aye. I vote aye as well, so that passes unanimously. All right, Katie, I think you are up next. All right, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. All right, I've been doing audits. Uh, today was the first day of audit field work at the cottage. So the three auditors showed up first thing in the morning and got settled down in the um, conference table at the in the cottage, and so I've been going strong everything's going well so far so so far so good and we're off to a good start is the first day the hardest no i, I mean none of them are any harder it, it always goes smoothly so it's yeah i know it's just, you, you know the build up of all of it and um it's <laughs> yeah, a little bit of tension yeah but it's yeah. good it's all good stuff so um also i wanted to let the board know that i'm going to be gone next month um, I will not be at the regular board meeting. So my plan is to present the July and August reports um, along uh, in the September board packet. So I've, I've done that once or twice before. So um, that works pretty well. I mean, all of the July and August reports will be included. I'll focus mainly on the August reports to just bring the board up to date. Um, so now, for now though, I'm going to present to you the uh, reports for the month of June 2021 for the Urbana Park District. So the first report that I will be presenting is called the Revenue and Expenditure Report. This report shows the receipts and expenditures for the prior 12-month period, the budget for the current period, and the preliminary unaudited results for the two months ending June 30th, 2021. Uh, the first page of this report is what we call sum one, and it's all of our funds except for the capital improvements fund. So it's a better look at just our operating budget. 
Revenues for this period were $4,521,000, which is an increase of about 2.6 million since May. 4 million um, of our revenues are from property taxes and we've received 50% of our property tax distributions for the current year. Uh, you can also see with camps and programs up and running and with the pools open that we've already earned more in two months than we earned for the entire year last year. So that's uh, pretty impressive what the first couple of months of our fiscal year can do. Uh, and then I also did a comparison too to 2019 at this point in time. Uh, so as of June 30th, 2019, which would have been our last normal year, we had 338,000 in fees here. So a little, we are, we're tracking a little bit less than 2019, but we're also a lot more than last year. So I think it's probably pretty right on for what we're expecting. Um, our budget is less this year than um, we adjusted our budget downward in expectation that enrollment wouldn't be as high in some of our programs due to social distancing. Um, when we were putting our budget together last winter and, and spring, um, staff was directed to use the phase four guidelines in all of their program budgets. So um, that included you know, limited capacity numbers and things like that. So that's the good news. Um, not that the expenditures are bad news, but moving on a little <laughs> further down on the report, uh, expenditures were $1,376,000, which is a change of $837,000 since May. And we have a surplus after two months, which means there's a, an excess of revenues over expenditures paid of $3,145,000. Um, where am I at? Okay. Moving on to sum two, which is only the capital improvements budget. Revenues for this two month period were $149,000. And the negative interest that you see here, uh, especially uh, for those watching at home, this doesn't happen only but once a year. But uh, when the fiscal year ends, there's a lot of audit entries that we have to do to close the books for the, the fiscal year and then open them for the next year. And one of those entries is called interest accruals. So there, we had a lot of CDs invested in the capital improvements fund because of our 2019A bonds. Um, we have all of the, uh, probably about half of the issue out in like a laddered CD structure. So any interest earned on those CDs still has to be recognized in the fiscal year that it was earned, but we won't actually get the money from that interest until the CDs mature. So we have to recognize it as, as revenue here in the prior fiscal year, and then we reverse it back out in May so that when the deposit actually comes in, this disappears and basically becomes zero for that amount. Um, I know it's a little confusing. It's just one of those accounting things we have to do. So, um, but that's why you'll see that negative interest until those CDs mature. So I just wanna make sure everybody was following that. Down below, um, expenditures in the capital improvements budget were $47,000. And we have also, so very surprisingly and unusually, have revenues exceeding expenditures in the capital improvements budget for this period of time, <laughs> um, with uh, the ending net revenue of one hundred and one thousand dollars for the capital improvements budget, which, um, you know, we're budgeting to have a decrease in fund balance of six million, six point eight million. So uh, it'll get there, and not that we're going to get that far, but we have, you know, all of the bond money uh, allocated for spending if needed. So. Um, let's All right, so lastly, sum three is the first two pages added together. And I always just point out, this is the ending fund balance of the entire district on the last day of June, which is $18,727,000. So if the district were to end today, that's the amount of fund balance remaining at the park district. And following that are the individual summary reports for our main working funds, which are the general fund, the recreation fund, the museum fund, and the indoor pool. And I don't mean to make you dizzy, but I will scroll on through. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about any of the uh, revenue and expenditure reports. All right, hearing none, I'm gonna move on to discussing the treasurer's report. So the treasurer's report lists the amount of cash that the district has on one day, June 30th, 2021. All 24 of the district's funds are rep represented. 
and then they're broken out into which bank accounts that the um, funds are invested in. And the total grand total for June of how much cash the district has on this one day is $18,170,753.72. The top of the second page of the treasurer's report lists amounts that we have in interest bearing accounts. So of the $18,171,000 on hand, $15 million uh, 841,000 is out in investments. And I know I talked about what poor investment returns we're getting and nothing's changed there. I haven't had any reinvestments, but you know, I'm not getting CDs. I can, have, I can put money in a savings account where we have full liquidity that's getting better interest than a CD where you're locking in the, the principal and don't have access to it. So I'm not doing a lot of CD reinvestments right now. I just have things out in our money market accounts and our savings account and the Illinois funds. So um, hopefully that environment will improve over the next, I don't know, six to 12 months. Um, the next section of on page two lists interfund loans. There were no changes to interfund loans this period. And lastly, the third page of the report lists the disbursements for the month of June and total disbursements of funds was $908,000 the largest being the bond payments that we made on the series 2019 uh, A bonds right. in June. So all of our usual bond payments have been made. And with That's that, great. I will present the treasurer's report to you for approval. Would somebody like to make a motion? I move to accept the treasurer's report for audit. Second. All right, we need, again, a roll call vote. Meredith, do you want again, please? Aye. Roger. Aye. Cedric. Aye. <clears throat> aye. I, I vote aye as well. So the um, motion passes unanimously. And now capital budget, Derek and Andy. Real quickly, I'm going to start and just go through the areas that there's been activity this period, and then I'll turn it over to Andy and Derek for any other updates. So on the Series 2019A bonds, there was activity in the rehab project, as well as the one-way way road system. And again, you're going to see a negative number here, and this is a different type of um, accrual. It's actually an accounts payable. And so this is for any um, expenses that were incurred in the prior fiscal year, but have not yet been paid. So we still have to recognize that those expenses in, were incurred, but we won't actually pay them until the future fiscal year. So whenever that bill gets paid, this will clear out to zero. So uh, it's just, it's kind of the reverse of the revenue side with the interest earnings, but this is an expense side. Um, and again, it's just to close out our fiscal year properly for audit. Um, Let's see, okay. Moving on to the uh, 2021 capital budget. There was actually, um, I realized when I was preparing my script that I made a mistake and as, as all people do, um, there was actually $3,850 earned in this, um, in this total that should have gone up into this tributes and donations line. So this actually really still should just be this $14,711 uh, and then the 3850 should be in tributes and donations. And I've already corrected it, so you won't see that again. Uh, but this is the total for the entire uh, capital budget for revenue is correct. And then the only expenditures that occurred was for stump, stump grinding um, that happened in this hazard tree line here. And in the 2020 budget, the, there were expenditures on construction crew projects. The, st the second installment was paid um, for the purchase of molecular reflection, was made to the artist. Uh, one of two trucks that was awarded in February was purchased. And in the contingency section at the bottom, expenditures were incurred on the fence cap for Blair Park um, and on tile repairs at Crystal Lake Pool. In the 2019 capital budget, expenditures occurred in the prior fiscal year on the saline project here. In the 2018 budget, expenditures occurred in the prior year on Urbana Park District's share of capital improvements at the Urbana Indoor Aquatic Center. And finally, in the 2017 capital budget, <laughs> expenditures occurred 
on Crystal Lake Park Rehab Project. And now Andy and Derek have some updates for you on capital projects. Okay, I can uh, start with a few quick updates on uh, first being the Phillips roofing project. Um, our bid is uh, advertised uh, for, distribu for distribution beginning uh, today. Um, this will replace that existing uh, asphalt shingles, which is covered by our uh, insurance from hail damage uh, claim that occurred uh, last summer. Uh, we included an alternate for standing seam uh, metal and some um, venting improvements, and those would need to be paid from UPD funds. Those weren't a part of that claim. Um, as far as schedule, um, our bid opening is scheduled for August 3rd, and uh, we're anticipating a board recommendation um, that month for uh, construction uh, this fall. Andy, uh, how much difference would you anticipate between uh, asphalt and um, seamed metal? I think the cost estimate had $60,000 more, sixty dollars or $70,000 more. So that's just our architectural uh, estimate, but- Sure, sure. And so the base with, for the with asphalt COVID was... steel pricing, I don't know how that's going to affect it from between when we had that oh, estimate yeah. and now as well. So yeah, I'm sure. going to be pretty interested to see how that plays out. Yeah. Andy, what's the difference in life in, in the lifetime of the roof? I think asphalt shingles is usually around 20 to 30 years and um, standing seam metal, I would assume is probably almost double that. Okay. It seems like, you know, the district's kind of been moving towards the, the standing seam metal um, where we can, but obviously budget's going to play a big part in this uh, decision and our insurance claim as well. Um, domestic hot water uh, replacement, just a quick note that we are on still on schedule for that week-long closure of the indoor pool uh, beginning August 2nd. Uh, contractor's been on site uh, last week to start reviewing their scope further with the uh, site foreman. Uh, they're planning on coming back uh, to get some additional measurements soon. Um, I'm planning a pre-construction meeting next week uh, with the engineer as well to review any other questions. Um, I just want to make sure that everything's kind of ironed out the best we can uh, since we have such a tight window uh, in that closure not to get anything uh, extended beyond uh, that week. Um, the saline habitat enhancement project, um, we had a visit from our project engineer and contractor this morning. Uh, Ted Gray, the engineer, was uh, extremely pleased with how things have uh, come along over the summer. I think his last visit was uh, maybe in March. Um, he was uh, pretty impressed with the habitat improvements from the structures, um, said they were actually exceeding his expectations. Um, he was... Uh, Noted some significant signs of improvement in uh, some water pooling and scouring, um, as well as seeing some signs of sedimentation around the structures that uh, also helps to improve habitat. So we obviously don't have any data at this point on um, as far as collecting the number of species uh, there, but I know that's something that IDNR was looking to see if they could do some sort of study um, upstream, maybe before the improvements and then downstream and with the rock uh, structures themselves. Uh, so I'll reach out to them as well to see if they're still planning on doing those. Um, other than that, we'll plan on doing a final walkthrough. Our IGA expires at the end of this year. Um, so this fall, we'll try to get as many people from the project team back together um, to do one more walk uh, at the site. Uh, I do have some pictures like usual. I'll try to share my screen here real quick. That's always a real highlight of the report to have the photos. And thank you for doing that. Hopefully I have some exciting ones this week. I think uh, last month we talked a little bit about the filamentous type algae that we were seeing uh, uh, covering the lake, which is different than uh, normal uh, years where we have uh, the smaller little plants, the water meal and, and duckweed and um, I think at the last meeting, we were working to schedule the work for the manual uh, removal of the algae. So here's some pictures first of the, the machine they used itself, which kind of looks like a tank. And then on the right or my right, you can see uh, the guy operating it. 
So he spent uh, two whole days um, paddling around the lake and then uh, gathering the algae and then depositing it on uh, a couple different uh, locations we had set for him where um, our staff actually worked uh, with them to then um, haul off the algae uh, to a, our compost uh, pile at the hickory storage site. And you know, if you had been around the lake in probably the last month or more since we've had this done, it's actually been, uh, it's been looking great. And the filamentous algae, um, really, I don't see very much of it at all. Um, recently, we are starting to see more of our um, more common or recently common um, water meal and duckweed uh, starting to show up. But um, for the most part, I think the lake's been looking really great for the uh, past few weeks, at least. And I will... have... Yeah, go ahead. Do you suppose you have to have special certification to drive that? <laughs> oh, to either. drive it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't believe so. I know for... <laughs> For any sort of uh, application that they're doing for like alum dosing and stuff, you do have to have a special certification. Okay. I don't yeah, believe you have to have it for this. It's quite a piece of machinery, isn't it? Yeah, it's not exactly what I was expecting. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't really this. Yeah. It but it, like it, it worked good. well. It's kind of slow going, but it got the job done. That's all we need. I think Katie might have spent an afternoon kayaking and pushing some algae as well. Um, it didn't so, work out. It did not work out. Other jobs is assigned. Is that how that comes? <laughs> it was just an excuse to go boating for an hour. Yeah, I think sounds like a great idea. Our, uh, our landscape islands. Yeah, our landscape contractor has been really busy at the site since the last uh, board meeting, uh, doing a lot of the plug plantings and the wetland shelves and those. Uh, stone cobbled areas and then here I just wanted to show kind of more of the unique uh, feature with the floating islands shortly after they had these installed um, and just as a reminder these are kind of another uh, tool in our uh, tool belt to help improve water quality uh, where these plants will take up the nutrients and help clean our water um, and improve the water quality overall from the sediment basin before the water uh, passes through the the bridge into the main body of the lake. Now, are there different plants on these various islands? Do we have to harvest them? How does this, how does this all work? So there, are, it's pretty much specified with the same plug mix from our wetland uh, areas. And uh, uh -huh. uh, these will be managed by the landscape contractor as part of the contract for the next three years. Uh -huh. uh, and then um, it'll be kind of on us, just like the other uh, natural areas to manage after that. Mm -hmm. Nancy, we, we previously met with a uh, researcher at the university who's done a lot of work with nutrient management in agricultural water systems, and mm -hmm. he was uh, a, a big proponent of these as well. He said that once the plants established, they had the, you know, these extensive root mats that enter the water below and helped absorb all sorts of nutrients. So we're pretty excited to see how they work. And how are these things anchored? Is it just like a big boat anchor or something? Or Go ahead, Andrew. Coffee cans full of concrete? Yeah, they had... You're close, yeah, with rebar <laughs> and tethered down to the bottom and weighted down. You can tell I have a dicey fishing past. <laughs> uh, I think so, they look fabulous out there. I'm really glad to see them. Yeah, I think once the plant's established, they're, they're really going to look nice. Oh, yeah. It's definitely a unique feature we've got going. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in Blair, uh, just a couple images of some site work for the playground uh, zone. Keith from our staff has had this area marked out, staked out for the equipment foundations as well. So um, the contractor's portion of the playground area is getting close to completion uh, once they get the under drainage uh, set. Uh, Keith from our staff is doing the installation of the playground and the challenge course. And uh, here's a couple pictures from the ADA improvements to the T-ball field. Uh, this is at the corner of oh, uh, wow. Florida and Vine, which I think turned out really nice. Looks great. 
and then a couple uh, angles. So the contractor, you know, started on the uh, would be the east side of the park and has been working uh, clockwise. So this is now towards the south uh, west corner, um, Broadway in Florida. Uh, the corner here where it starts to turn and head north, which is now, if you can see my cursor starting to move around the mm -hmm. Little League field, this is when they were getting their subgrade uh, compacted in preparation for uh, my next pictures, which is the concrete um, work, which was then completed. This is looking, mm -hmm. um, would be east down Florida uh, towards that T-ball field. And then here's that same corner that we had just saw uh, after they had their concrete work completed. I think I took this last week. And then finally, just another kind of amenity that has been uh, poured in the last week, which is the half court basketball. Um, so the contractors still pouring and working on that path work around the perimeter on the west side. Um, but they are going to start to make a move towards more of the interior features that uh, connection path that'll go um, between, you know, will connect this basketball court, uh, the playground, uh, the accessible horseshoe pits, and then move in between those two tennis court sections where we'll have the challenge course. And so they should be pulling that playground equipment soon uh, and then start the site work for that as well so that Keith uh, can get out there uh, similarly and stake out uh, where that equipment uh, would be placed before they put their drain uh, tile in. So we're anticipating all that equipment for the uh, playground and challenge course then to be delivered here in the next uh, two weeks uh, so that what we uh, requested and asked the contractors to have all that site work uh, ready for Keith uh, where he could start to begin his installation in August and that would give him uh, a few months where it's not in the dead of winter to get everything uh, installed. I don't know about other board members, but I've had more people getting a hold of me wanting to know what is going on at Blair Park. I think it's it's more than I've ever had in any other project. I think that we've done it's really quite interesting. Answer mostly enthusiasm or concern or oh, no, no, they were. It was most mostly curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just wanted to know what was happening. Nobody was worried and nobody was unhappy. But yeah, a lot of interest. So, I mean, I think just because folks are out in their cars going by that maybe more often than they would our more peripheral parks. Yeah, it's pretty uh, high I've, visibility. I've, I've heard so many positive comments, particularly from my neighbors, because we're not that far. And um, uh, some of them are, I, well, one, one woman has a, a, a four-year-old and a, and a uh, almost a uh, year and a half old and she takes them, she has a little trailer on her bike. She takes them regularly up there to watch the construction from a <gasps> distance. Oh, I bet they love it. Yeah, they really do. Just wanted to mention there was a terrific News Gazette article. I hope folks are seeing that in the paper too. Fabulous spread on the work there, a lot of photos. Fortunately, they got Andy's name spelled wrong, but um, we can That's not that. the first time that's happened. <laughs> I bet. Probably won't be the last either. I've got two two small updates that are capital related. One is that I previously reported to you all that the sanitary district is cooperating with MTD on a project to put solar out uh, on the back half of our Hickory Street site that we lease from the sanitary district. Yay! That's, yeah, and that, that solar will fund uh, fuel rather um, uh, a hydrogen uh, compressed gas uh, system that will fuel uh, several MTD buses. Um, they're actually going to have a a piped connection go beneath University Avenue over to the uh, main MTD build, the building. So that's very exciting. And uh, they started doing borings on that uh, within the last week. Um, the other bit of news is, isn't, isn't so good, but it, it's not entirely awful. Um, you know, we, we'd begun having some discussions with Corky staff about um, our intention of developing uh, a uh, master plan for our athletic ball fields and uh, one of the areas that we were talking a lot about was lighting at ball fields and where we would need lighting in the future and where we wouldn't uh, as we look to develop Weaver Park lighting will be uh, an important and sensitive topic um, and, and uh, before we even began our study uh, you know Corky and his staff reported that the, the lighting at Prairie ball field the hard ball would not be needed long term 
Um, about two weeks ago, uh, we had uh, Remco go up with uh, uh, a lift, a, a crane, uh, to replace some lights that were, were uh, failing. And they came back with a, a somewhat uh, cautionary report that uh, a lot of the, the lights up there are in bad shape. Uh, the, the, the horizontal uh, trusses that support the lights are, are beginning to loosen uh, the hardware. And uh, I think at this point, we're, we're looking at an expedited removal uh, of, of, those, of those lights. And we've already notified that the school district, they don't use them for uh, Urbana High School baseball. And there's there's a handful of programs, I think, that, 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 that use them at all. Is that correct, Corky? Yeah, it was mainly uh, college U of I rentals for like a club team. Oh, OK. That's not so bad then. We've also. Um, been watching the utility bills for those lights. Every time we flip the switch, the the, the demand charge because they use so much energy from uh, Amrit is just astonishing. And so, um, we uh, if we were going to keep to keep them, we'd want to put in LED uh, something to be much more efficient. And uh, the orientation and placement would be entirely different than they are today. Uh, and so, for that reason, early thoughts about trying to retain some of the wiring have been sort of forgotten. Uh, we're just going to move forward with abandoning the the, the wiring and. Uh, then seek out a demo contractor to remove them. So um, I, I think there's, there's a good chance uh, by our next board meeting, uh, they'll be removed. Uh, if, if the oh. pricing continues to stay above 25,000, because we got a preliminary quote from, from our electrician, uh, we, would, we would bid it and bring it back to you. I'll approve it at that board meeting. But uh, I think there's a decent chance we'll be able to get done for, for less than that. That's all I've got. Oh, I guess I have to start paying attention here. All right. I think then, Tim? Yep. You're up. Thank back. you guys for doing that. That's It's always good to hear what's happening. Sorry, Tim, go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Uh, starting out, just wanted to share some You Belong Here updates. The Matrix team uh, sent along some accomplishments that I just read them. There are three um, that relate to the strategic plan, and there are uh, completion. Goal number three, objective B, expand staff involvement and number of locations. Urbana visits to provide on-site youth program registrations, utilizing CARL scholarship funds uh, to nine annually. So that's a nice achievement. Glad about that. The next one is um, strategic plan goal number four, objective A, increase program guide and free page distribution to community organizations and or neighborhoods by at least four, and we've done that. So we're very pleased about that. The net last one is strategic plan, plan goal number four, objective B, research and implement ActiveNet Spanish and French customer user interface module. So they've completed that. We really appreciate that. That's the team that helps move those things along. Certainly the leadership team uh, consults and helps, but it's really a staff effort. So we're really pleased with that. The other you belong here thing I wanted to mention that's coming up, uh, the really cool Bridging the Art Divide. That's gonna be the new artwork that's gonna be at Crystal Lake on the bridge. I was fortunate to be with the, the other staff that was on the um, panel to select. There were just a ton of submissions, wide, wide variety of age. I'd consider that an age-friendly event. We had some very young kids all the way up to some lot older adults. Um, and it was very difficult to make the recommendations of the ones that would go forward to be displayed. So again, I think everyone present, and there was probably a dozen of us, could see that's got a lot of legs. Um, we had some UPDAC folks um, on that panel too, so it was really fun. And you know, just seeing the creative work out in the community, creating outlets for um, people interested in arts is really important. And there are very few canvases in the community where we can um, express that. So. Um, we're really excited about that, and I think there's a lot of growth potential in that. Moving along to my regular report, just wanted to start out with a few recognitions and thanks. Just want to thank the Ground and Arbor team for the just amazing landscapes we have at all of our main facilities. If you haven't been out and about, I'd recommend you take a tour. I strongly recommend we consider starting our own garden walk at the Park District where we would feature facility gardens, special gardens at Meadowbrook and select natural areas. I bet we would have a lot of folks interested. Um, so that may be something we could even trial, you know, mm -hmm. ourselves, but uh, we know this is a horticulture community and uh, I think we have a lot of potential to grow. 
on that. Also want to thank the aquatic staff just for the great job they're doing at the aquatic facilities. I forwarded on to the board a compliment from a patron that, not that noted a, a drill that was taking place and how professional it was done. Of course, we appreciate that and know what a good job they do. And we also know that that could change in a second. You know, the outcomes could be that, that close. So we appreciate the hard work of the aquatics group. Also want to thank Katie and the administrative team for the audit process. You know, it's an ongoing year long intense job. And then there's an intense couple of months of really pushing hard. Um, and thanks to Katie's oversight, um, she's not able to go to other meetings and she's very gracious about that once the work continue. And then we loop back to her and report. So she's definitely included. Um, but looking at all the awards we have received year after year, I think it's worth it and uh, reflects their good work. Also want to thank Jackie Willis. She was our Boneyard Arts Festival, Meadowbrook Park um, featured sculptor on June 19th at the Meadowbrook Interpretive Center. Um, we had a wonderful Saturday uh, sculpture exhibit there. She was slated to do it last year and COVID canceled us out. So she graciously returned. I'd recommended to staff that we offer, start our, offering a stipend, just a small thanks um, to the artist. Most of the people are out of town and come a long way. And um, while they might have the off chance option of selling something, you know, it's just helping us out. I think they know us and they like what we do. And certainly they're, they're probably saying yes to the personal connections. So we appreciate Jackie's work and all the past sculptors that we've had and artists. Also want to lastly recognize uh, the Mark in the Park segments. If you're watching those, they're really wonderful. The last interview with uh, Jacob Johnston was terrific on some of his work. I really appreciate the um, kind of spot on interviews that really give a focus on particular aspect of what the district's doing. And I, we hope people are tuning into that. A lot of great information and it's a lot of fun. And I think Mark does a really good job. Wanted to call out and recognize the effort for the 48 hours of peace that was going around the community. Um, we had a couple of events at our parks and there's ongoing events throughout the summer. Um, so we just really hope that's a fruitful exercise. The reports I heard, there's a lot of attention and a lot of focus on that. So we're appreciative of that. Obviously it's to uh, try to make an impact and reduce the uh, number of, of shootings and the gun violence in the community. So we'll continue to watch that and see how, how those reports over the rest of the summer go. Uh, let's see, just wanted to <clears throat> report that the CC First group countywide is starting to do our follow-ups with our legislators for all the asks. Obviously the KRT is important to us and uh, we're working and had reached out to Senator Durbin's office again to see if they would be willing to anyway help negotiate with us with Norfolk Southern on that small stretch next just north of Weaver Park. Uh, so we'll hope, be hopeful we'll get some attention and see positive things from that. Just want to mention that our KRT steering team meeting is in Urbana this Friday at Weaver Park on site. Um, the idea is to kind of get familiar with that site, visualize the uh, permanent trailhead facilities, check out the trail and uh, the Main Street connections just to get familiar with how things will eventually come into Urbana. Also want to report that we're moving, trying to move ahead with the IGA, the inter, uh, Intergovernmental uh, Agreement between the Park District, the Forest Preserve and Conservation District as a start. Our hope is that others would later sign on. Did meet with Mary Ellen Wohler and Jamie Pasquale. He's the Executive Director at Vermilion County Conservation District. I think he's moving more to a favorable position on that. I think it's important because we really don't have any sort of you know document that ties us together but more importantly as we hopefully receive grants and funding that may be a mechanism that you know helps us divide funds and share and, and work alike so stay tuned on that also want to report we have our second uh i'm calling it the new 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 uh, effort on the friends group for the krt that's going to be um coming up uh july 22nd next thursday at kolb park in saint joe so we're trying to move around the county to different sites to attract different people. Yeah. We had uh, about 35 people attend the first meeting and it sounded like more were interested. Obviously with summer, people coming and going, we may see ups and downs, but I think it's starting to gel now and we've really needed that. Uh, so we're excited about that. 
staff continues, um, our staff steering committee continues to work on the DCO grant that will hopefully fund the rest of the build out of the KRT and specific facilities at Weaver Park. So we have a vested interest in that. Uh, just some updates on the health and wellness uh, process. Last Thursday, Alex uh, Fruin came to Urbana. He's with the CCS group, had a wonderful working dinner, covered a lot of ground, uh, I guess mapped out our you know, final stages of the public campaign. There's a lot of moving parts and overlapping from the um, you know, silent phase, the quiet phase to now. You know, I think in short, our steering committee is going to continue to reach out to anybody and everyone, you know, that we have a chance to, but probably some of the new targets are some of the businesses and we'll get new assignments and we'll be working on that. Um, our work uh, is coming to a close. I believe August 13th is the end of our second extended con uh, contract with CCS. I think our staff goal was to get our development manager in place, get them at least warmed up and uh, get some other specific training set up for uh, Jeremy um, with CCS. But, you know, at some point we probably have to finish the campaign on our own. Um, and so I think we're working on the transition. You know, what are all the things we need to um, get Jeremy set up with? What does the steering committee need to do? Obviously close any deals follow up with any gift agreements, make sure we're, you know, getting all those uh, paperwork elements together. Um, so I think that's challenging for staff because, you know, we've had the benefit of working with them and any, anything we needed was a call or an email away. But again, we kind of need to move into the rest of the project using the good training and, and skills we had. At today's check-in meeting, you know, we talked a little more about that and obviously, um, you know, we can outline things we, we still may need help with, um, but I think that's our general plan is to move forward and, and take the rest of the campaign ourselves. And again, there's overlaps. You know, we'll probably be talking to people in the uh, private phase, you know, later this fall. And I imagine in the winter, we'll be talking to more businesses. So, um, but we did sort of arrange at what I think we would call an ideal schedule. And that would look like, um, maybe by December of 2021, reaching our goal, being able to uh, draw a close to at least the major concerted effort of the campaign. If we could have a you know fall or late fall launch or some dedication event at the site, we think that would really be a way to bring all the people together, bring the neighborhood in, um, have a little celebration, and then look at bidding over the winter, and then perhaps a spring uh, you know, construction start. So obviously it's contingent on fundraising. Um, we're hoping that our own DCO grant comes through and that would probably meet that timeline. So that's kind of the preferred plan. Obviously, if we don't hit those marks, the team's gonna continue and we'll stretch that out as short as we can, meaning we'd love to wrap things and be able to announce and, and get into construction. Um, so we're very excited. And again, we're all committed to the full program. So, you know, cutting it short or, you know, building something less is not one of our goals. It might be a fallback, you know, if we were not able to reach our goals, but we're all confident we will. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, let's see, moving on. Today we had a discussion with the planning group about the, uh, what I'm calling OSLAD 2. There's been an announcement for another OSLAD um, grant. It is uh, the due date start July 15th through September 1st. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what a good request for that would be. I think original ideas were something with the outdoor elements at health and wellness, but we also followed up with an in-depth conversation about Prairie Play and how it's coming up. We're hoping there's another grant the next cycle that might tag that one. Um, and then Kara was um, very direct. Um, you know, she pointed out that we may not get another grant. We have a few outstanding grants and depending on how the state staff looks at things, you know, is there an opportunity to spread things out further? Um, so we have been fortunate um, and we're in grants, but again, we like to think positive and that our compelling projects linked uh, to a great facility would score out and, and maybe bring us some additional funds. So we'll have to wait and see. And again, that isn't the final plan. That was just really the discussion today. So that, that could change with new information. We, moving on Prairie Play, we uh, had a uh, Zoom uh, meeting with uh, Michelle Kelly from Upland Design. 
kind of outlined some next steps for Prairie Play. It is coming up very quickly. Um, while we're excited and we know it's going to be an exciting thing for Urbana, I think the staff concern is, you know, we have several overlapping projects now that are pretty major. Crystal Lake, I would include Blair, although that's at least seems a little more finite. Um, that'll complete, you know, it's not a necessarily a, um, you know, five or 10 year endeavor. Um, and then we have the health and wellness facility. Um, so how do we sort of maneuver another energetic project? We know the foundation can't be on constant fundraise mode. Um, and so looking at who and how we could maybe raise some additional funds, I think we have at least tagged 200,000 as a target. Um, but the, again, these are preliminary budgets. We haven't done any work with the community um, yet, but I think that was sort of the latter part of our discussion. Maybe later in this year, we could see forming a panel to get some you know, preliminary discussions, um, get a procedure or a, a planning process outlined and, and a time schedule, and, uh, and then start moving forward on that project. I guess, uh, you know, some ideal um, opportunities would be getting a grant, going into construction. Um, you know, if we could start that work in 2023, that would probably be a reasonable uh, time frame there. So stay tuned. Again, we have a lot of things going. Um, we're going to keep UPDAC busy this year because they'll be front and center with all of our efforts. Also wanted to mention, you've probably read in the papers and been hearing about some of the uh, American Rescue Plan strategies and funds that are going to different groups. As you know, special districts were excluded from any direct funding, and I'm not really sure why, but I think what we're being encouraged to, is to go ask the others that have received funding. So Kelsey and I worked on uh, letters that went out last week to go to the city of Urbana, Champaign County, and the Urbana School District, which will all receive um, recovery funds. We identified projects that we could need help with, um, and we debated on putting price tags, and we decided not to do that. We emphasized uh, interest in meeting and discussing what their process would be and, and kind of sharing those projects. We did select heavy infrastructure projects and priority projects like health and wellness. Um, so we'll see how those discussions go. Our understanding is the funding window is pretty, pretty long. It could go out as long as five years. So we may not get funded next month, wow. although I would like it next month. Um, but we, we understand this is probably a longer game on that. So we'll see how that evolves. Certainly, if we had meetings and discussion, we might learn more of what their intent is. But we do know that many other community groups, not-for-profits, are sending in request letters for help. So we wanted to get ours in and um, at least hope, hope for a bigger discussion. Uh, let's see. Two last items I wanted to uh, mention. You know, Derek and I and the operations staff have been talking about just just some kind of negative things going in the parks. We're seeing large groups still assemble, um, leaving messes behind. We had some neighbor complaints over the weekend. Um, so again, these are not rented um, parties or events. So it's really hard for us to you know, know who and what and what's going on. You know, while we wish people would call the police to get some immediate attention if it's you know, disturbing the peace, um, but we wanna start messaging that staffs working with their band of police. And I know Derek's um, talked a little with the Champaign Park District about an ambassador program they have. Derek, did you want to mention any of that? Sure, yeah, they have a park ambassador program where they employ uh, mostly retired officers, some active officers uh, to go out and um, usually the shift is 5 to 9 p.m. Uh, Friday and Saturday evening. Uh, they'll also rotate uh, some other evenings uh, through the week um, they've had some uh, details at the, at the pool as well. Um, uh, you know, historically, we've used our, our police fund uh, in this manner. They, uh, in, in Champaign, they're, they're using it to hire uh, these off-duty and retired officers. Um, and it appears that it's being relatively effective. Uh, you know, we, we talked with uh, one of the officers that helps to coordinate it. Uh, I went out uh, on the 4th of July and observed them working uh, uh, Hustle Park. Um, and that probably wasn't a fair uh, assessment because there was a lot going on in Hessel Park that day and they couldn't be everywhere. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's something we're, we're, we're looking into and evaluating more. 
Uh, it would be something that we could use our police fund for, and historically we've only used a small portion of our police fund to hire officers at the, at the pool and uh, doing some additional park details. Um, so something we want to consider. Um, I will tell you that uh, I saw just in, in uh, the news today that a couple, and I need to verify this, but uh, a couple of the uh, portable toilets in Champaign parks were, were lit on fire. And so I see Laura's nodding her head, it happened. Um, so, you know, you, you just can't be everywhere. Um, but, you know, the, the intention of the ambassador program is, is to have uh, some additional uh, eyes in the park when, I, when our staff can't be there. Uh, they're um, um, hopefully, you know, really tr truly acting as ambassadors and going up and, and, and helping people understand, you know, the rules and why the rules are there and make sure the park is safe for the use and enjoyment of everybody. And so that would be our intent if we, if we bring this program forward. And, uh, we'll, we're finding out more about it now. Thanks, are Sarah. these scattered incidents in, in, in parks or are they concentrated in just a couple parks? I mean, for us? For us, it tends to be large gatherings in a, in a handful of parks. Uh, um, the, the, the Crystal Lake Park has always been a, a popular destination for large groups and it continues to be so. Uh, Ambex Park is, 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 is being enjoyed by a lot of folks. Uh, mm -hmm. And it started last year with, with COVID, you know, it was um, safer to, to have gatherings of, of family birthday parties, these large groups outside and, and Ambux Park became a, a popular destination. It's continued through today. And so, um, you know, uh, I would say that a lot of times uh, the, the groups uh, do a great job of cleaning up after themselves, uh, but there are a handful of groups that continue on after dark when they really shouldn't be there. The parks close after dark. And sometimes I think that there's, um, you know, some, some, some level of intoxication taking place that, that uh, preempts them from doing a good job of cleaning up afterwards. Okay. Also, we're, we're not the only groups there, you know, Derek mentioned Champaign, but over the summer, we've talked to Decatur Park District, Springfield Park District, Savoy, Champaign County Forest Preserve, um, and Vermilion County also conservation district. So it's probably a result of COVID, I'd like to think. We really want to know why, because we think if we knew why, we could come up with some alternatives. But we're going to continue to track it. I think this ambassador program might be a good way forward. Um, and we'll see how things progress. Lastly, I wanted to invite Corky to do an update on the outdoor pool and any news <laughs> yet on that. Yeah. I was talking a little bit in the beginning, but I, I've got a, you know, based on our numbers this year, we're down a, a little bit from 2019 right now, but um, that's to be expected. We're, we're not taking um, day camps, our day camps. We're not going over to the pool because we're not doing transportation. Um, and, you know, the weather's not been great for the last week and a half. Um, before that, um, we were kind of right there, even with the uh, 2019 numbers, but right now we're about 7,000 visits behind um, 2019. Um, but again, that could change between now and next month, um, just based on when the bad weather comes and those kinds of things. So I think we, overall, we've been happy with the attendance um, on those good pool days. Um, we're still getting some camps from, you know, other facilities, other districts, other daycares. Um, staffing is uh, going very well so far. Um, again, like I said, probably last month or the month before, we're, you know, we're pretty short staffed, but the staff that we have are doing fabulous work. Uh, they just really received uh, elite status from Star Guard, our governing body for our lifeguards. Um, so we've got a good good crew. Um, again, we've got another class of lifeguards coming in here in the next uh, week or two. So we'll <laughs> hopefully gain a few more staff. Um, we always lose some staff in August, so we're a little concerned about August. Um, but uh, Leslie and her, her team has done a fantastic job um, managing what we do have. And also kudos to them. They put in a lot of time guarding and managing at the facility as well, based on the fact that we're short uh, staff. But 
on and off the uh, uh, Nadiators has around 170 kids. Um, that was reduced on purpose um, just to availability of times for practices. Um, in the past, we've used um, outdoor and indoor while we're not doing public stuff necessarily at the indoor yet. Um, that'll kick in in the fall um, once the outdoor closes. Um, a typical season for Nadiators is around 220, 230. So uh, a little bit smaller numbers, just like uh, all of our other programs. Um, but all in all, we've, we've been pretty happy with how things are going. Corky, do you think most of those kids are from Urbana? Um, I would say 75% of them are from Urbana. Huh. That's good. So we've also got our year round program that's uh, working a little bit. I, our numbers are probably around 25 to 30, um, which is not unusual for summertime. Um, we, Michelle Zimmerman, who's coaching, I believe she's an assistant coach for our outdoor season, um, but she's kind of taking the lead on our, our year round program while we're in search of a, a replacement for Ed who retired. Thanks, Corky. Good information. Yep. Nancy, that's all I had. I can answer any questions. All right. Well, I don't hear any snores from France, so I think the president is probably okay. Last I've texted and emailed with them, they're fine and having a nice time. Great. Um, okay, liaison reports. Roger. Um, we the finance study group uh, has not met since uh, since the last uh, board meeting. All right. Policy study. The policy study group met uh, in April and we are working on future meeting dates. Doak, Roger, you're up again at the foundation. Yeah, we, uh, we had to cancel our, our meeting yesterday because uh, we had a lot of people missing. So uh, we have not met since, uh, since before uh, our last board meeting, so. Cedric, do you wanna tell them what we haven't been doing? about with the uh, planning and the updeck. Yeah, um, I guess that we last met on June 8th to discuss bylaws and topics for the first half of 2022 and recruitment and appointments. Um, and then of course we went through those recruitments and appointments. Right, right. Um, and then we, I don't think we have a planned next meeting yet. Yeah, no, I, th I, think, we're, I think we're good for a while. But is that, wasn't that our decision or? Yeah, things are rolling and we've got it in hand for the next bit. All right, old business. We got a budget book. Okay, that's me. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to, um, I have the budget book pulled up and I just wanted to walk you all through just a few highlights of some pages that I wanted to draw your attention to. So um, the everybody have their book handy? Yes. Okay. You don't have to, I'll have it on the screen, but the first thing I wanted to show you was uh, something I did a little bit new this year. Um, I, thought cool. Meredith might, I thought Meredith might like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, our leadership team has had a couple of meetings where we're talking about reviewing our mission and vision and values. And, um, a suggestion that came from that team was to try to change our values into a word cloud. So I did that. So I plugged our, there used to be just a page of black and white text here um, in all of the previous versions. So I basically just copied and pasted that text into a word cloud generator. And um, this is what came out. So I thought that was pretty cool. It yeah. is cool. It is very cool. Thank you, Katie. Um, pages five through 21, um, and I don't mean PDF page, I mean the page that's printed, the page number that's printed on the document, um, 
are the annual is the annual goals document. So these are our final goals um, where you can see that, you know, every single one of our strategic plan goals has sub goals underneath it for this fiscal year. Uh, and we recently went over the district wide ones, but all of the departmental goals are represented here. And I wanted to give a big shout out to Kelsey who compiles all of these goals into one uh, consistent document and formats it all for this um, budget book. And she does a really fantastic job. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, I'm gonna make y'all dizzy here. Let me just stop sharing because I gotta get down a little further here. The next page that, um, Pages 27 to 32 are various um, tax information of the park district. So let me see, I got this pulled up now. So it talks about what our tax rate is and how it's changed over the last 10 years. That's what this page shows. This page is an estimate of how much your tax bill would be for various different prices of homes. So if your home is valued at $90,000, for the 2021 tax year, your total tax bill uh, will be around $3,200 and the portion that is paid to Urbana Park District from your bill is $381. And then it goes up from there for different home prices, just to give people an idea of how much of your tax bill goes to the Park District. And you can see it's about 10% of the bill, just over 10%. Um, it's a great value. This page um, shows the different tax rates that are available to park districts to be able to be levied. And then it discusses if the park, if Urbana Park District levies those or not, and at what amounts. And then um, uh, this page shows, sorry, more like this page. This one shows total tax rates for all people that live um, within the city of Urbana. So um, this is the 2021 tax rates and then the park, sorry, this is Urbana Park District's tax rate broken out by all the different funds that we levy. So um, the total tax rate is like 10.5 um, or something and then ours is 1.2 of that. And so here's all the different funds and how much we levy by each fund. And then we're expecting to levy 7.5 seven million dollars this year in tax revenue. Finally, um, this page shows about over a 30 year history of how the assessed values have increased in, um, in the Urbana Park District. So that's kind of interesting. And there was a few years where it actually decreased as well. So, um, but it's, it's been slowly increasing the last five or six years here. Following that are um, where we start getting into charts and graphs. So the tables on pages 34 and 36 give you a comparison of the prior year's budget and the current year's budget. So here's the prior year, here's the current year. Um, and then the uh, second graph just shows the operating budget, which then takes all that capital out, which is kind of a better look at our day-to-day -day operations. And you can see our park districts funded on the revenue side, about 77% by property taxes, with, with the ne next largest category of revenues coming in for fees and facility rentals at just under 10%. And then on the expenditure side, uh, just like most organizations, the largest expense for the park district is for full-time staff salaries, which is at about 25%. And that's followed then by debt payments of 18%, almost 19%. This last chart or table on um, page 38 is the actual budget and appropriation ordinance. The main difference from this, uh, this particular table compared to the first table that was shown on page 34 is that the budget and appropriation ordinance is a legal document that we have to file with the county. It's actually um, our legal appropriations. We're not allowed to go over the spending authority of this document. And so some of the categories of expenditures have been um, increased so that to offset if other additional revenue sources become available. So it's slightly higher than what our actual operating budget is. So the whole rest of the document shows our actual budget numbers, but this particular uh, piece of information is slightly larger um, for the expenditure side of things. 
And that allows the park district to have the appropriate the appropriated authority to spend if more revenue is received without having to go back and do supplemental appropriations and things like that. Um, following that, just um, just a couple more highlights here. Page 39, this one, even though it looks like so, a slightly different format, this is what we normally would call sum three. So this is all funds district wide. This is the total sum summary picture of the park district and it, it matches the table on page 34. Um, and then pages 41 and oh, sorry, pages 40 and 41, this is sum one and then page 41 is sum two, which is just the capital budget. And then after that is just all the individual funds broken out by department. So you can get an idea of all of that detailed level of spending. Yeah. Um, but most of the bulk of what I want to draw the board's attention to is towards the first half of the book. So anybody have any questions about that? It's slick. Pretty good. Nice job, Katie. Thanks. It all comes together. Um, okay. So I guess next is action on ordinance 2021-06 combined budget and appropriation ordinance um, by state law the annual combined budget and appropriation ordinance must be approved and passed before the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year this action appropriates the monies that are necessary to cover the projected expenses and liabilities the district may incur during the fiscal year All right so we need a motion please Move to approve ordinance 2021-06 combined budget and appropriation. Second. All right, let's have another roll call. Cedric, would you like to begin, please? Aye. Roger. Aye. Meredith. Aye. I vote aye as well. So that's an approved unanimously. Um, we did not remove any old business from the consent agenda, so we can just trot right ahead to new business. Um, this is a sales agreement with the city of Urbana for 909 and 911 North Lincoln. Um, do you want to talk about this or should we just go right straight into it? What's we, what? we can. I think I provided some background, Nancy, in my yeah. report. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. whatever the president would like or the vice president would like to do. But basically, it's cleanup work, transferring the last bits yep. into the right hands. That's the short of it. Anybody have anybody have any questions, any comments, any Thing other than another motion? Well, I think the price is right. Exactly. <laughs> it is. It's a nice move. It's it's uh it's 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 lovely to be able to work well with the city and to have this nice give and take and um, working together as opposed to being poles apart and just struggling with what the city's doing or they're struggling with what we're doing. So and I know that doesn't come without effort. So I want to congratulate you on keeping another ball in the air. I was thinking before how much when I was listening to Tim with all the things that everybody's doing, it's, I mean, it's like juggling a whole barrel of ping pong balls. I don't know. I don't know how you all do it. Great really team. Pretty. Yeah. And you're all really good jugglers. All right. So then I guess we need another motion. Anybody willing to give us a hand? and move to approve the sales agreements for the city of Urbana for 909 and 911 North Lincoln Avenue, Urbana, Illinois. Second. All right, we have our motion seconded. Uh, Meredith, would you like to start our roll call, please? Aye. Roger. Aye. Cedric. Aye. I vote aye in as well, so that again passes unanimously. All right, our next item under new business is the um, action to award the UPDEC Outdoor Learning Pavilion <laughs> Design. Um, Tim, do you want to talk about this? Is there anything you want to tell us? What, um, where should we go from here? Sure, I think Andy's uh, probably going to cover the actual uh, yeah, details. I, okay, ahead. I can start with a, a little bit of background and share some sure. project information. Uh, this is for a museum uh, grant, which was a uh, uh, planning process. Uh, we started um, for an application in early 2020 with uh, Ratio Architects 
Um, at that time, they helped us with uh, cost estimation and uh, renderings for our overall uh, program uh, that was included within that, that application. The uh, project <laughs> provides for a new uh, multi-season uh, pavilion for environmental education, uh, rentals, and what will be the new um, outdoor summer camp headquarters for Nature Day Camp which would uh, be replacing uh, the use at Northwoods uh, Pavilion. And uh, as part of the application, we had uh, received letters of support from uh, community members. Uh, we reviewed and received support from UPDAC uh, all before um, submitting that final application in, uh, I think it was last fall. And we were uh, notice, provided a notice of award uh, later that year um, which was for an $808,000 project with $750,000 coming from museum uh, grant funds. So tonight we have the proposal from Ratio uh, for design services that would take us through construction. Uh, and that's in the amount of $96,000. And we are um, also recommending to include a 10% contingency uh, which would be $9,600. Um, as far as schedule, um, pending the board uh, action tonight, we'll look to uh, continue into schematic design phase this fall. Our plan is to then bid it uh, this winter, uh, potentially have it under construction uh, spring next year in 2022, um, potentially being ready um, for some summer camp season next year. I do have some pictures to share as well. These are some renderings I think I've shared with uh, the board and UPDAC uh, previously, um, but for a reminder and uh, to show anyone watching from home just what this project entails. Um, let's see. So here we're looking at the uh, northern portion of Crystal Lake Park with the Nature Center uh, up top and the uh, outdoor pool here towards the south. Our primary project area is located uh, over here towards the eastern portion. Um, and the project will include a new parking lot, it's 26 spaces, uh, solar lighting, uh, rain garden, and then accessible pathways that would then connect to the learning pavilion, which uh, was a main uh, part of the grant, and then connections from that pavilion uh, to the Nature Playscape and to the Nature Center. So here's a couple of those renderings that were included within the application itself. Uh, you can see that the pavilion um, was kind of chosen aesthetically to blend into the surrounding facilities uh, in the area with the standing uh, seam metal roof, um, stone and block look, and then what's in the rendering here to my right also shows um, kind of like outdoor heavy duty curtains, canvas type drop down uh, so that we can have the ability to program this space uh, in multiple seasons rather than just being stuck to um, when the temperatures are overly uh, pleasant. Um, and that's really falls in line with some of our strategic plan goals uh, as well, which is to provide um, multi-season uh, educational opportunities um, and environmental education specifically. So these, the, the curtain things actually drop down from the support beams. Is that how it goes? Yeah, we, oh, cool. they, uh, they kind of roll. You can kind of see them here. They're rolled yeah, out. Right. Oh, that's really nifty. Great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and then kind of getting more into the the size of the pavilion. I think this image here on the left just kind of shows you how much space we have. There's eight picnic tables that are um, fitting underneath the overhang at this portion and then kind of zooming into the block structure itself. Uh, the large storage room. Um, again, one of the main purposes for this facility is, is to replace the use of Northwoods Pavilion for day camp. Uh, that pavilion does have a large um, support uh, building uh, with the structure itself that includes a storage room and then a gender neutral uh, restroom, um, water fountains, 
And then we have a fireplace that will have uh, staff be able to secure when not uh, needed for program usage. But again, that kind of goes into having um, programming extending into different times of the year and times of the day as well. Andy, will yeah. that re restroom be, be usable year round? I think it'd be like our the rest of our restrooms where okay. we'd shut them down. Um, I think it's in October, late October. Okay. And how does this compare in size, say, to the um, pavilion up by the by the barn at Meadowbrook? Just to give us a ballpark, it's yeah, bigger, I think, right? I think Prairie Play Pavilion has I could be wrong six picnic tables. Six. Six. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. I feel like it has six, so it's a little bit uh, expanded footprint here. Okay, good. And then uh, finally, just kind of a different angle looking uh, from a different perspective on the other side, just to kind of show, um, trying to get the architecturally um, pleasing aesthetic uh, in the park as well. So I'm happy to answer any other questions if you have any. I'll just mention that um, Tim and I uh, uh, had a conversation with one of the immediate neighbors uh, to this area in Crystal Lake Park who um, had some concern about what was you know, proposed. Uh, you know, we, we did have a previous open house where we had some good attendance from neighbors. And um, one of the things that we talked with that neighbor about was making sure that there's an opportunity for public input, you know, as this process moves forward. And we've talked with Ratio about that, and we're even envisioning maybe some um, smaller stakeholder meetings for the immediate neighbors that live in the vicinity of the facility. Um, obviously, it's going to be, you know, a, a change, but it's one that it's really needed. Uh, we, um, we, the existing day camp pavilion has, has a lot of shortcomings, and um, there's a, a need to provide something closer to the nature center. Uh, this will be safer for the, the camp kids, you know, in the event of a a storm um, and this will also address some of the parking issues that we have and drop off issues with, with day camp as it, as it exists today so um, we're we continue to have those conversations with the neighbor and we're, we're committed to, to working on an outcome that uh, serves all of urbana but also recognizes we have some some, some neighbors that, that we want to work with as well what were their 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 main concerns i, I think it's just change mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they really like the, the very quiet kind of serene uh area uh, uh, adjacent to the nature center. Um, they, they had some concerns when we built the pool and we worked with them on, on those concerns at the time. So it's, uh, you know, everybody has sort of a different perspective on, on, on the best use of, oh, sorry, my Siri woke up, um, on, 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 you know, kind of a, a best use that, that, that area. And we need to balance, you know, all the different needs for, for, for Urbana, all with our neighbors. I'm optimistic we can do it. Yes, I agree. It's probably an, another comment too, you know, just a difference between a park like say maybe Meadowbrook that doesn't have a lot of neighborhood right around it compared to one that does. And long-term, you know, over a hundred years, people remember when, you know, the park was a lot quieter and, you know, it was more of a daytime option. We're really kind of changing our park district overall to meet the needs of our community. And so with that comes change. And as Derek outlined, you know, that change, depending on how close you live to it, probably looks different than, you know, where I live. Um, and so we're just trying to give people an opportunity, you know, to be heard and listen. If there's anything we can do to, you know, incorporate um, things that would hopefully make it better, we would do what we could. But they would also have to understand that, you know, there are probably are changing needs in an urban park district. Crystal Lake is probably gonna be at one of those places, you know, that would undergo a lot of change to meet today's park district needs. So we hope we can strike a balance and, you know, keep, keep the wheels on the track, but try to do what we can do to soften or um, deal with any of those concerns. I think listening is probably the biggest thing and you guys do that really well already, so. All right, one last motion.
I moved to award design services for the UpDeck Outdoor Learning Pavilion project for $96,000 and a design contingency for $9,600 to ratio architects of Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, all right, last roll call vote of the evening. Meredith. Aye. Roger. Aye. Cedric. Aye. I'm going to vote aye as well. So there we are, another unanimous vote. We have no more action on new business. Uh, we have no action on new business removed from the consent agenda. Um, any comments from anybody before we're closing up shop tonight? Going? Going? Gone? All right. I'll adjourn the meeting. We'll see everybody at the beginning of August 1st, 30 sessions.